Okay, hello everyone. I know people are just joining now. Um, you're all muted, so if you could just say hello so that I know that you're there. <laughs> um, maybe you'd like to tell me where you're joining from. I know there are people joining from around the world to the new look language show online. London, okay. Barcelona, fantastic. Dorset, lovely. Amazing. Oh, cool. An international crowd. This is most exciting. Hi. Oh, career. I've mentioned you in the in the power in the PowerPoint. I'd be glad to know. Do I have any dog lovers today? Any dog lovers in the house? Ah, oh, a fellow Cambridge resident. Excellent. Okay. Um, slide eight is just for you. All about dogs. You'll be excited to know. Dictionary.com introduced 23 new words about dogs in just one quarter of last year. Oh, I'm better with my pug. Is it a pug or a Puggle, a pug mixed with a beagle. More about that later. Hello from Bedford. I went to school in Bedford, a very nice town. <laughs> Wonderful. No crosses. Okay, yes. Pure animals at all times. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to do a little preamble as people are coming in. Um, so, a couple of sort of disclaimers before the, the talk. Um, any opinions expressed in the talk are not necessarily mine. I scour academic research to compile these talks for you. So they may be the opinions of people who participated in research, or people who compiled that research themselves. I'm going to talk, I talk about vocabulary, obviously. I'm going to talk a lot about English for two reasons. Firstly, that if you've joined this talk, you presumably know English. So it's the language we all have in common, which makes everything easier. And also because English is, it is coincidentally particularly good for illustrating certain word formation processes. Um, during the talk, I'm going to have to close the chat. If you want to communicate with each other in the chat, I think you can, but I can't see anything that you're writing while I'm talking. Hopefully there'll be time for, for questions at the end. If there isn't any time, my email address is on nearly all the slides and you're very welcome to take it down and send me an email with any question that you might have and I will reply. Um, particularly if you want information about something you could read or something that I might have to go off and look up for you, that actually suits me quite well. Um, so the, the ongoing predicament in which we live and have done for the last 18 months has generated quite a lot of new vocabulary. I hope nobody will just be disappointed that I haven't really referred to it because I think we've heard so much about it all, already. I've tried to include different types of vocabulary to try and shake all of us up a bit. Okay, I think I'm going to have to make a start now. So I'm just going to close the chat. Um, but during the chat, if you think of a word that you'd like to share with everyone, a word of interest, feel free. And if there's time at the end, we could have a chat about general words that you're interested in or you like. Okay, so just a bit of information about me, first of all. Whoops, a good start. There we go. Um, so I, I, I'm a language teacher. I teach in uh, a university, Cambridge University, and an independent school in Cambridge and these are some of my interests which you see there that you can uh, peruse um, at your leisure. Bear in mind that this talk like all the others will be recorded and it'll be available online later on so if there's anything you want to come back to then you can. Okay so words. Um, what is a word? Now at the risk of invalidating my own talk in the first slide we're already we already hit a problem because no one can actually agree over what a word is all right. Um, if you look at different 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 dictionaries, be they specialist linguistics dictionaries or ordinary dictionaries, they give very quite different definitions, really. Um, we've also got the word, the term lemma and the term lexi, which come into play. So a lemma is kind of like a root word, a dictionary word, if you like. For example, sing as opposed to singing or sung. All right. Um, so it's a, a main word rather than one of its kind of derivatives. So that complicates things a little anyway. Are sing and sung different words? Are they part of the same word? Okay, so we've got three dictionary definitions here. We've also got Bloomfield's definition, um, a famous linguist that you may have heard of. And he said that a, lang a word was a minimum free form. But that raises the question, do words occur in isolation? You know, is a word really the minimum 
unit, not joined to anything else that can appear in language. Um, for example, a word like the, do we ever say the in isolation? The, do we ever say had in isolation? Usually, a word like water, for example, that could be used as a compound, like in the word waterfalls, it's part of another word, or in water purification tablets, it's separate from the other words. So it's all a little bit ambiguous from the beginning. Also, um, if, if we consider a word as a unit of meaning, that's not the same across languages. So I've got a very long Norwegian word here. I'm not terribly good at Norwegian pronunciation, so I'll leave any Norwegians among you to, um, to say that under your breath. Um, but essentially, there's one word for weapons of mass destruction, four words in English, okay? The word ali in French, which I can pronounce, um, that is a past participle. And we know from that one word that it's past in French, we know it's past, we know it's perfective, so went, not, was going, or used to go, or whatever. We know it's feminine, and we know it's plural, so four bits of meaning out of one word. So, you know, um, again, the plot thickens. Also, we've got what we call phonological words. Now, these are words which um, look and sound the same, but they mean different things, or they're different parts of speech, such as park. Syntactic words. So these are words which are related grammatically, such as um, maybe parts of a verb, and I put some parts of the verb to go there. We've got went, for example, went is a complete anomaly. It doesn't look like the rest of the paradigm of the verb go, but do we consider that a word on its own because it looks different? Are they all words in their own right? Or are they all part of the same lemma, the part of the same word? Should they be considered under just one umbrella? Then I put the word done from Slovene. That means day, and it's got, if you take into account plural, dual, singular, genitive, nominative, etc., it's got 16 different forms. That's an awful lot. Are these 16 different words, or are they just one word? And this question of what is a word arises, because very often to try and digress in a lesson, a child will go, Dr. Mitchell, how many words are there in English? And questions like that. I know why they do it, but it is a fair question, and people often want to know these statistical things about languages. We don't really know, it depends, because vocabulary is, is infinite. We talk about numbers being infinite, but so are words. And, and a word has to be documented in a dictionary, really, in order to be able to be counted in a language's total number of words. And this is a bit like the predicament of the world's fastest man, who I gather is Usain Bolt currently as the record holder. But actually, there might be a man in somewhere in Uganda or somewhere who's much faster than him. But because he's never been in a competition, we don't know about him. So there could be all sorts of words around, fairly common use which are not in the dictionary, so they're not counted in the big total. Also, dictionaries take a very, very long time to update. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary undergoes four yearly updates with up to 800 entries each time. Um, the second edition was in 1989 with about 120,000 words. And the Oxford English Dictionary and the Collins Dictionary have enormous corpora. They have enormous databases from which they draw words. The Collins corpus is about four and a half billion words. Um, also, the, we, the, it, it's rather complicated by the issue of obsolete words as well. It's easy to get into a dictionary. It's, it can take about five years to get into a dictionary, but it's much harder to get out again. And you might see in a dictionary word mark obsolete. That means that it's not in current use and is termed obsolete usually after about 80 years, but it's very, very rarely expunged altogether from the dictionary. So we end up with rather a backlog of words that we don't often use, but they're there anyway, so they're included in the count. Um, so yeah, the answer to the most and fewest word question, I don't really know, it depends. People um, ask it, people often ask as well if they're learning a foreign language, oh, Dr. Mitchell, how many words do I need to know? Again, guess what? It depends. It depends on your subject matter. What, what are you learning the language for? Do you want to read literary classics? Do you want to go on holiday? Do you want to watch television? It depends. Um, exam boards and qualification organizations don't usually publish word counts. But on balance, if you want to achieve C2 level, that's the highest level in the CEFR, uh, that's like the European Framework of Language um, Assessment, you might need around 10,000 active words and about maybe 20,000 passive words. So active words that you know and you use as opposed to passive words that you can just recognize. Um, and that ties in with the question of how many words do people know? Well, again, it depends on many things. It depends on the age of the person. It depends on your definition of the word. It depends on their degree of language input. And it also depends very much on the survey that you look at. Figures vary wildly. I read the other day a survey suggesting that a 20-year-old American might know 42,000 lemmas, so dictionary words, 
but this could vary from 27,000 to 52,000, so it's conveniently vast. And it will also increase typically during your life. And it could be that, that person's vocabulary is primarily passive. Their words that this American can recognize, but would never, would never normally use. All right. Okay, so this brings us on, um, talking of statistics, to hypersymonomy. Dr. Mitchell, is it true that Eskimos have 500 words for snow? Okay, well, this is a, it's a little bit of a myth, actually. Um, it's to do with um, findings of um, uh, people like Franz Boas, who was an, an American anthropologist, and Benjamin Whorf, um, who was an American linguist. Um, and it relates to the idea that in, in cultures where something is very, very predominant, it's very prolific, then speakers typically have large numbers of words for it. But the business of Eskimos and words for snows is problematic because Inuit languages, which is the correct name for them now, um, are, are quite fairly diverse. It's not just one language, it's, it's, it's a family of languages. So do we include all of them in our definition or just some of them because their language is in their own right? Also, what is a word? You heard it here first. And um, we need to remember as well that Inuit languages are agglutinating languages. So they comprise segments with different grammatical functions. So where does the word end and where does it begin? However, I should have asked in the chat if there are any Scots in the audience. Now, I hope there are, because this is for you. You'll be glad to know you do have an awful lot of words for snow, more than the Inuits have. There's a brilliant new Scots thesaurus, which has been published. If you go on a well-known search engine and type in Scots thesaurus, you'll find it. And it's got more than 400 words for snow. Look, they're wonderful. A snowdrift with a specially shaped top has its own word. There are also lots of words in Sami uh, spoken in the north of Finland and Norway, um, relating to reindeer, interestingly. And something I discovered, which is actually quite sad, I put him multicultural London English, but I think I probably mean urban British English, is that in this is kind of like, a, 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 it's a street jargon found in many urban centers in, in England now. And it has a number of influences from say Arabic, Jamaican, Patois, various other languages. And rather sadly, this variety of English has an awful lot of words for knife, gun, and you can see some of them there. And that is proof that um, if something is prevalent, unfortunately, in this case, in the culture, then a lot of words will be created for it. This is also, I'll come back to the um, matter of covert prestige in a minute. Um, the police, I gather, have started using sort of ling language consultants from communities that use this sort of vocabulary so that they can understand things that interviewees say, because they, it, it's an in-group slang, actually. It's in-group vocabulary, and outsiders typically don't understand it. Um, okay, so back to morphology, because I did mention morphology in terms of minimum proof forms earlier, so I want to talk to you a bit more about that. So it's the study of the grammatical structures of words, all right? And um, we've got various kinds of morphemes. We can, we've got um, pre-morphemes, so that is an element which can exist independently of anything else. So platypus, it's quite long, but it could, it's a word in its own right. It, it's an element in its own right, which is meaningful. We've got bound morphemes, on the other hand, these tend to be affixes in English, and they can't exist on ish actually I'll come back to that there's something interesting about that one so they're mainly affixes traditionally as well we um we can distinguish inflection and derivational morphemes inflection tend to be grammatical so they give us information about an existing word such as tense number gender derivational don't derivational morphemes don't do that necessarily they might make a verb into a noun they might make a noun into an adjective write writer um editor editorial things like that okay um, there are an awful lot in English, and I'll talk about them a bit in a minute. Some are much more productive than others. If you look at the examples I put here, T and R uh, at the end of a word, very productive in that we still use them. We still add them to new words. But TH and N, they're very, very unproductive. They're, they're older prefix, uh, suffixes, which just don't tend to be used as much anymore. Um, and I put a few examples there as well. I'll come back to anti disestablishmentarianism a bit later. Okay. So firstly, um, I'm going to talk now about some morphological ways of creating words. And a new word, by the way, is referred to as a neologism in linguistics. So we're talking about internal creation. What resources does a language have to make up its own words without getting them from other sources? Something that is very, very prolific in Germanic languages in general, actually, is compounding. And this is where you form a word from two or more units, which are words in their own right. And in English, there are certain patterns which are particularly common, and I've put them in this table here. Remember, you can come back to all this 
online if you wish to later on. Um, you might have two adjectives, a noun and a noun, or a noun and a verb. And, uh, compound words tend to fall into those sorts of patterns. I put two examples from Dutch, okay? When I was talking about um, the function of words and the number of words a learner should, should, should learn, I forgot to tell you an anecdote. So I did a degree in Dutch, a master's degree in translation and interpreting. It's actually quite embarrassing. I learned hundreds of words, probably, about the construction of dikes and folders and things like that. Then I found myself in Rotterdam, unable to buy a sandwich. From a lady who couldn't speak English because we assume all the Dutch speak English brilliantly but this lady couldn't um, and I thought well actually so I know a lot of words but it doesn't really fulfill any particular practical function for me right now so numbers of words when we're learning is illusory generally okay but here this is one of the words I did remember a geotechnical survey policy that is the first word it's three nouns and I hope I've spelled this correctly I do apologize to any Dutch viewers the second word with a determinant plus three nouns is multiple personality disorder and I put some examples from English at the bottom very very prolific in in um, Germanic languages okay I think they're really interesting there are loads of them about acronyms these are quite amusing actually so an acronym is when you take um, the initial letters of a phrase and you put them together to make a word and what's very interesting about these is that over time People forget that they're just initials and they have other words as a backstory and they become words in their own right. And this often leads to, to tautology. We've all heard people say, oh, I've forgotten my PIN number. And you're basically saying, I've forgotten my personal identification number, number, which is not really necessary. It's a bit redundant. And, and also these words, can they can acquire derivatives, which is quite interesting. So uh, where are we? Um, we've got lol, laugh out loud. She did it for the lols. Lol has a plural now as in jokes or funny entertainment. Um, taser could be a verb and it could be put in the past tense. Okay, um, MC, he's MCing in club, so that could be made into a present participle with the uh, addition of the relevant affix. So they're very interesting and they're, again, lots of those around in English and we very often don't, we, they, they, they're so ingrained now. They're so kind of, um, sort of, they're, they're so woven into the fabric of the language in a morphological sense, we don't think about them as anymore okay you ready for the dogs there we go blending it's maths with dogs no it's actually i'm joking it's actually where you normally take two elements of a word and join them together typically in english we have the beginning of one word and the end of another word all right however the cocker spaniel and poodle that violates this to produce a cocker poo but think if it were a cockadoodle, it would probably look like that creature there. And that's not that's not pretty, not pretty. As I said, dictionary.com in just one quarter last year introduced 23 new words of this type, all blends to reflect the increasing popularity of mixed breed dogs. Okay, but there were numerous other other um, examples as well. I just just thought this would be fun. You know we are with animals, I always say. Okay, affixation. Now this is um we're going back to, to bound morphemes now. So these are elements which don't usually appear on their own, okay? Um, they come from different sources in English. So you can see in the list of prefixes and suffixes, actually, we've got some um, indigenous ones like un, indigenous to Germanic to English. We've got anti, which is a learned prefix, which we've borrowed. We've also got um, mega, which is from Greek originally, but it's become popular recently in popular culture, or it was mega interesting. Uber as well from German. Um, yeah, he's uber intelligent, and that's kind of come on trend over the last few years. I'll come back to anti in a minute, along with ish. Um, okay, so some of these suffixes, so for example, dom is a very old suffix that's from Old English, and we find it in words like kingdom. As you can see down here, I've put at the bottom some, some recent examples of affixation. Um, but we've now got official, official dom. So that's been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, but actually it's still slightly productive. Not very much, but we, we do still find it. Interestingly, interestingly, in English, as a rather mixed language, lexically, we find words which comprise both Germanic and Romance elements. So we've got un and ness, which are Germanic, and gracious in the middle, which is Romance. And we've got uh, all of these combine those two elements. I went a bit mad with this next word. Technically, there's no actual, Dr. Mitchell, how many affixes can you add? As many as you like, I say indulgently. Um, you can add as many as you want, basically. I don't really know what that means, but I just kept on adding them. And in principle, there's not actually a limit to how many you can put. They're a bit annoying for learners of English because particularly the negative ones are a bit unpredictable. 
all of these here in the next to bottom bullet point, they're all negative, but how do we know which one to use? It's a bit difficult. There's no one that encodes negativity specifically. You've just got to be aware that they all do in some kind of capacity. And um, what's interesting about um, ish, why I put it on its own, is that actually it's starting to take on its own pre-morphine value. So are you feeling better now? Mm, ish. I've heard it with anti too. Yeah, I'm a bit anti that kind of thing. I'm not. That was not my prescriptiveness coming through. It was just an example. So yeah, this is always, always an interesting change going on anywhere in languages. Okay, how else have knowledge been created? So there's a bit less to say about these. Change of function, very, very common in English. Okay, and to, these words have mostly gone from a noun to a verb. So I'm really bossing it. I'm going to gift her this thing. He ghosted me yesterday. Cringe has become an adjective from a verb. Oh, it was totally cringe. Um, a change of meaning. So in Old English, queen was any woman. It's now the queen, very specialised meaning. Connect was a young man. It's now a knight, specialised meaning. In technology, this happens a lot. So a word, acquire, it doesn't change its meaning, it acquires another one, mouse, bug, and web, mean different things in the world of, world of nature and the online world, okay? A snowflake, they might acquire a connotation, okay? So a snowflake being a kind of, supposedly a wet, spineless person who doesn't want to do anything, they might melt if they're exposed to high temperatures, that's the idea, okay? So it can be connotation, not just cell transfer of meaning. Abbreviation. That happens a lot. Um, so we get quite elaborate ones like God be with you became goodbye. Now it's bye. Why not? It's the principle of least effort, a linguistic principle I like to live my life by. It's actually real, seriously. Um, we've all got other, we've also got other well-known ones like gym, bra, vet, prep. Prep, however, has gone the other way. It's gone from preparation to prep, but it can now have der derivatives. So we've got um, he prepped really hard for the exam or I've been prepping for months for the marathon, so it can actually have affixes attached to it to make it have a slightly different function. Back formation, so we've got some examples of where a verb has been derived from a noun um, or a, a noun derived from an adjective, that's a bit less common. And eponyms, so this is where a word, a new word is created, not really new because it was a proper noun, a person's name or a place name, but it's slightly changed its function. This is Mr. Biro who invented the famous ballpoint pen, and there are many others here as well. Incidentally, these, all of these mechanisms are found in other languages. They're not peculiar to English, but English is particularly things like compounding, very, very prolific and, and, and blending to all the dog names. I can't see them necessarily catching on in every single language, because all languages have different sort of morphological rules and structures, okay? Um, but as I said earlier, I'm using English because it's a, a language that we're all familiar with, and I don't have to explain too many extra things. Okay, now we're going to talk a bit about external sources. So why do we borrow? Why do we borrow foreign words? Okay, so the main thing to remember about this is that borrowing is a contact phenomenon. Now, I'm not talking necessarily geographical proximity, but that may be the case. I'm talking about some kind of cultural contact, okay, which is very, very... That's, 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 it, that, that's increasing all the time as the world shrinks, as we spend more time online, as the internet becomes a more important way, a more significant way of transmitting and disseminating new words. The world is getting smaller, there's more and more contact constantly, okay? Cultural prestige is very important in borrowing, and what typically happens is that the, what we call the matrix language, that's the language that you're just speaking, mind your own business, and then the donor language, or the embedded language, that's the language which you borrow words from from time to time. Not always, but very often, the Embedded or donor language is of a higher prestige than the matrix, matrix language. Oh, that works. I think I'll use that one. So I've got a few slightly different examples here. Okay, so words like uh, blood and lubled, they're from English and well, um, multicultural British English and French, respectively. Now, these are examples of what I would call cultural prestige. Okay, these are not high words. These are words used, they're kind of in on the street, words used very informally. So blood is, I think it's derived from Jamaican patois, and it's like a bro, a brother. Le bled is from Arabic originally, and it's it refers to a village or the countryside, or maybe being in the sticks, or where you originally come from, okay? Um, but those, both Jamaican patois and multicultural, you know, it's like urban British English, and um, Arabic in certain speech situations in French have a degree of cover, prestige, they're cool, okay? 
there's a bit of street parlance, you know, you'll mark yourself out as a, a member of a certain group if you say these words, and people outside your group might not understand them, which is convenient for you, all right, there's a, a bit of prestige there. Kimchi, that I believe is from Korean, Korean culture is on the crest of the wave, it's really, really popular and fashionable at the moment, so we're starting to get lots of words from there. Virtuoso, well in the early modern period, Italian was a vehicle of high culture, and has been in many languages, not just for English, French particularly, in the Renaissance. Uh, so we have words like virtuoso, which have come in. Interestingly, epistaxis is the learned word for a nosebleed, derived from Greek. Um, so actually, this results in doublets, borrowing often results in doublets. So we have kind of a, a low indigenous word, nosebleed, as a high learned word, epistaxis, which we borrowed. Conceptual innovation. Well, you borrow a thing into your culture, but you haven't got a word for it. I'll borrow the word as well. Why not? Okay, so we've got emoji, we've got a Danish word, which I shan't attempt to pronounce. That came on trend a few years ago. Zeppelin Bluetooth has been borrowed by many languages from English. Okay, and aardvark and tomato. They were once conceptual innovations. Tomato comes originally from Nahuatl, or where Spanish. And I'll talk in a minute about the journeys that words make. We don't borrow them directly very often. They take by security food. Okay, um, war, it's a type of combat, fair enough. All of those words came into English from Anglo-Norman. Commerce as well, money came from Anglo-Norman. Um, aduana is uh, customs in Spanish derived from Arabic. And Arabic donated an awful lot of words into Spanish and Portuguese in the early medieval period. Not just to those languages, to many other languages as well. The Arabs led the world, the known world. They were pioneers in the early Middle Ages in everything botany and astronomy and algebra and medicine and agriculture, all kinds of things, okay? And actually, even today, 40% of the vocabulary of Dari, which is one of the official languages of, of, of Afghanistan, is derived from Arabic. We find Arabic words in Urdu as well. So um, that's got a lot to do with prestige. It's got a lot to do with colonization, with the spread of a religion and a culture as well, okay? Um, Le marketing in French, quite a lot of borrowings in the sphere of management, commerce, et cetera, come from English, okay? Um, colonization, now this is a very interesting one. So the word, um, the word skin came into English from um, Old Norse in the, um, the uh, Saxon period. If you attended last year's talk, you, will have, you may remember that I mentioned that, Old Norse and Old English were quite similar and they tended to sort of blend. And we borrowed rather a lot of sort of core borrowings, quite important words from Old Norse. Um, stunk is from an indigenous North American language, uh, dingo from an indigenous Australian language, impala I, be, I believe is from Zulu, and jumpers, that's two for the price of one, that's an eponym because it's a, it's a town in India, and it's also a, a, a borrowing from colonization as well. Um, prairie, that comes originally from French, and it came into North American English usage through the coexistence of kind of being an Anglican colonizers, and the same with cookie, which originally came Dutch and came into English through the coexistence of colonizers who had two different basic languages. Now, I've discovered in um, research that um, most of which I've done in Gabon and Cameroon on language endangerment, people often say, oh, you know, our languages are dying out because they're not very good, they haven't got enough words, you can't use them for anything. Any language has the wherewithal to create new words. Okay. Icelandic is particularly good for doing that. They don't really borrow words, they create their own, but it doesn't always happen, okay? You need political will, you need the will of the speakers, and sometimes it's just easier for reasons of prestige to just borrow a word from another language. All languages can create their own. And I noticed too, I prepared something similar to this for a lecture that I give a French sociolinguistics course at Cambridge University. A distinct absence of words from sub-Saharan African languages borrowed into, say, English or French, for example, despite hundreds of years of colonial contact. And I think this is evidence of the prestige factor that in the minds of the borrowers, not consciously necessarily, um, no concept or idea had been imported from there, which was really worthy enough to bring the word with it. And of course, there are exceptions like Impala, for example, but there really are very, very few, given how many we borrowed from other sources. So that's something that's important interesting. Just to take very quickly through the journey of a word. Again, I prepared this to do with French because I prepared this for a French sociolinguistics class. And um, borrowings can go through a number of different languages and adaptations. So the word for apricot began in Latin, traveled to Byzantine Greek, then to Arabic, then Catalan, and then appeared in French in 1512, first documented then, and then it 
came to England as well. The word for to check it, to check, okay, that began as the Persian word for king, became the Arabic word for check in chess, went into Latin, Old French, Middle English, Modern English, went across the Atlantic and then came back because a lot of borrowings from English into French currently have come from North American usage rather than British usage. That was first documented in 2000. Uh, the Kuching, that's actually a bit older than you think. It was documented in, 1960, in the 1960s. But that came um, originally from a, um, a type of wagon, which had been named after the town in Hungary where it originated from. Um, appeared in France in 1560, went to England, went across the Atlantic, and then came back again. I've got one more. Uh, hashtag. Okay, so that was a Germanic word, all right. Um, first testified, first attested in French as Ash in 1138 went to England in the Norman period, went across the Atlantic, came back again in 2009 as hashtag. It's so interesting. Okay, now, saying on the subject of French, we have Claude Agers, who is a French Tunisian linguist. Is borrowing always a good thing? Well, he doesn't think so, okay? This is a translation of something he said in an interview he gave to Le Point a few years ago. And um, his concern is, which he's written about, is that beyond a certain point, a language will lose its integrity if it keeps borrowing. A thing called relaxification occurs, whereby, in principle, a language's vocabulary could be replaced wholesale. Okay, so language A, the matrix language, could actually disappear because so many words have been borrowed from language B or the, uh, the embedded language. Okay, so you can see there what he says. He thinks it's fine up to 7 to 10%. I mean, French is Huge, has a huge number of borrowings. Um, borrowing feeds and enriches the language. It's something they all do. Then it becomes a bit indigestible. Then it becomes a threat. And then over 70%, you're on sticky ground. So we need to watch out because English has borrowed about 60% of at least 60% of its words, actually. Um, and we're still borrowing, as I've said earlier, all the time. But somehow English hasn't, I don't think anyone could say that English has got no integrity, that no one really knows how to speak it anymore. Um, so English is a very, I mean, thing. I think the thing with English, rather like with Arabic in the medieval period, Italian in the Renaissance period, it still enjoys considerable global prestige. It's the language of the internet, the language of technology, the language of many aspects of popular culture. So it's still, it's actually very strong um, in terms of speaking perception. But I've got here an extreme case of borrowing. Again, if you were with me last year, this may look familiar. I put a different cartoon, however, to vary it a bit. So in Norman Britain, the Normans weren't really interested in sort of changing the way we did things. They just liked territorial annexation. And they, 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 they integrated, so they intermarried. Um, and that meant that the language that they used spread, the vocabulary spread, okay? Um, and we've taken about 10,000 words from Norman. Um, from Anglo-Norman, that was the variety of French spoken in occupied uh, England. When you think that actually, according to all these surveys, I mean, you know, a person's active vocabulary might only be 20,000 words. That's a, a massive proportion. Think as well that at that time, in the me early medieval period, people knew fewer words. And I'll talk about the dissemination of words later, but they didn't have the lexus a typical modern day speaker of English might have. And I've left most of, I think they're all in the original old French spellings. You can see how little they've changed. You might not know any French at all. You might think you don't know any, actually you do, because you know most of these words. And we've got these semantic doublets. I referred to epistaxis and nosebleed earlier. We've got labor of work, close and shut. We've got things that mean exactly the same thing. Or they might have a very slightly different connotation. Maybe one's sort of a bit more formal than the other, etc. Um, so yeah, it was like boring results in these doublets, which are quite interesting. Okay, right. This is the sinister part. So how is language borrowing linked to language death? Going back to the um, what Claude Agege said about this. So prestige is a very important factor. Okay, and um, when I teach this course um, on sociolinguistics at Cambridge, the first lecture is about lexical borrowing. Then we those are sort of words, and then we talk about syntactic borrowing, so borrowing structures. Then we talk about code switching. This is where you have typical, a biling, typically a bilingual person or family or community, and they kind of appear to chop and change between one language and another, or one language and two others while they're talking. And there's actually a bit more to it than meets the eye, but it warrants a whole, a whole language talk because it's a vast subject. 
Um, but essentially, you've got language A, which is your matrix, matrix language, the main language, and language B, the embedded language, where you borrow things from. If this happens to be a particularly prestige language, then we might be on a sticky wicket borrowing wise. Okay, so what might happen is that A step borrows content words extensively from B. Okay, and then the structural features of A start to converge towards B. All right, so we've got the code switching, we've got this code switching element. All right, we've got an importing of syntactic structures, grammatical structures. What happens next is that language A can gradually be supplanted by language B, okay? So when we start to get vertical transmission of A declining, so that's when older people stop teaching it to younger people, younger speakers begin to move over to B because it's often the prestige language and they abandon A, which is the language of their, their ancestors. Then A survives in isolated expressions. It's spoken typically by elderly people in rural communities. For a young person, it's not cool. If you speak it, oh, you sound like a, a yoga or something, oh, we're going to speak that. And then you end up with these elderly people, the elderly speakers who are first language speakers of A, dying off, and then B is the main language. It's a very extreme situation. It doesn't happen all the time. It, it requires an awful lot of different factors, okay? But that is potentially what might happen with just borrowing. That could just be the tip of the iceberg. I've got here a picture of the Palenco people who in their fine ceremonious reg ceremonial regalia, they're found in French Guyana and parts of northern Brazil, and they number only about a thousand people, and only about two thirds of them have an active knowledge of Palenco. There are many semi speakers, this is people who can't speak it properly. Um, it's an oral language, there's no written tradition, that's always potentially a problem. There's nothing to refer back to or record the language. And there are mass borrowings from French and from Guyanese Creole. It's not just competing with French in French Guyana, where the state language is French, but also with Guyanese Creole. So it's got two quite strong local competitors. It's also crucially got no internal neologism. The people haven't created new words using indigenous stuff. And there's a very, very high rate of code switching. Um, so that's a language, if you want to look on, I think it's endangered, endangeredlanguages.com, you can find information about lots of languages, that kind of situation. But I said, it's, it's, it's extreme, okay? So not all languages, are at risk. Now, something people often ask, Dr. Mitchell, how do people learn new words? How do they get around? Pretty quickly nowadays, actually, in the past. So I've got here these legends, William Shakespeare and Geoffrey Chaucer, who contributed vast numbers of words, actually, for individual people to the language. Um, the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust um, note that Shakespeare is believed to have contributed 1,700 words to English. And then John Milton, John Dunn, Ben Johnson, Thomas More, and Chaucer, of course, contributed many more. It's difficult to prove whether they were the first users because there was a less literacy at that time and fewer texts available. That meant that it was much, it would have taken these words quite a long time to be disseminated, months, years, maybe, okay, because people relied on word of mouth, plays, recycles of poems, etc., literature, the education system for a lucky few, okay. Nowadays, it's much faster. So education systems are the norm now. Everyone goes to school, well, nearly everyone. Um, mass media, okay, television, radio, newspapers, the internet as well, that is the thing, okay? So now, instead of taking years to go around the world, years, maybe decades, a word could be around the world in a week. A new word can be around the world in a week on Instagram or Twitter, particularly Twitter. This map at the bottom, I found this, it's a survey that was carried out in America on, on fleek, okay? How did this word spread across America? And it shows by using Twitter and by seeing when the people wrote comments and where they were writing from, the, um, the people doing the survey were able to see how it spread, where it started, where it's used most, where it's not really used very much. None of us is safe, okay? So be careful what you, what, what you put on Twitter. You might be being monitored for language statistic purposes, okay? And that, amazingly for one of my language show talks brings me to the end five minutes before time i very much hope you found it interesting and i very much hope you'd like to find out more if you've been to one of my talks before you'll know i'm a bit obsessed with david crystal in a good way and i always recommend his book so he's written about every aspect of language um, and he's done so much to popularize language as something relevant and accessible to everyone so if you want to know more about Shakespeare's contribution, there's a book there. He's done one just about vocabulary. And then 
There's a whole handbook about the word. And if you want to know more about maybe morphology and semantic change and things, um, an oldie but a goodie, Victoria Fromkin's Introduction to Language, which has now been reprinted many, many times, that is available from various well-known online booksellers. But thank you so much for your attention. And we've actually got a few minutes for questions. So if there's anything you'd like to write in the chat, then um, feel free. Thank you, Alison. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. Computer Munga, I just saw that come up. Oh gosh, yeah, we can put Munga on the end of things. Munga's a really good suffix. Thank you, Charlie. Yes, you can. So please, if you'd like a copy of my presentation, please take down my email address, which is ram1002 at cam.ac.uk. It's on all the slides. Do get in touch if there's anything else, any questions you have that you'd like to ask by email. The word woke, apparently it's to do with being awake, as in awoke. Yeah, as in aware, aware of what's going on. Munger. Sounds a bit all, uh, sounds Germanic to me. I'm not, I'll have to check out Manga. I'll check it out and let you know. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Amelia. <laughs> I go through things really fast because I'm always afraid of overrunning and I finish on the dot normally, but it's rare to have. Those things in English like Ajej, it depends on the kind of linguist you're looking for. If you're looking for a popular linguist, David Crystal, he doesn't pay me to keep mentioning him, of course, but then there are lots of other ones. Uh, Jean Aitchison, is a very um is a very well known. I think she's British. She's written a lot. Victoria Fromkin, who wrote that book there. And um, you've also got Peter Tradgill and John Wells, who've written a lot about phonology. It depends what you want, really. If you want any English linguists, uh, just let me know, and I can send you some recommendations. Oh, it could be yes, perhaps yeah. And on fleek, yeah. <laughs> I think on fleek going out of fashion. I did um a talk on um on sociolinguistics last week, which I'd done two years previously at the language show, and I had to change half of the vocabulary. It changes so quickly. It was about youth slang, it wasn't relevant anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Phil, glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> ah, interesting. Okay, Christina, can you think of any, can you think of any examples? I mean, yeah, so anything, anything perhaps related to genocide or conflict, to denote some some word related to the aggressor, the perpetu the, the, the perpetrator, perhaps. Yeah, that could be considered a borrowing. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, yeah. I mean, with, with prestige, it's a bit difficult. We, we can also, it doesn't have to be good necessarily. It could also be an element of power. Okay, so for example, um, the Celts were the original inhabitants of the British Isles, but we don't speak Celtic languages anymore in most of the British Isles. We do in some areas, of course, but it was perceived that the Germanic invaders were somehow better. So let's start using their language. It's not that people like them particularly, it's, it's to do with power, not just prestige really, yeah. Um, yes, yes, I think so. Certainly in terms of the whole the sign, that, the issue of the sign, yes, definitely. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's funny with French because there are so, um, I, think, I think any French speaker would acknowledge that there's quite a prescriptive attitude, quite a normative attitude relating to the French language. But equally, these borrowings seem to creep in, but only in particular areas. It's funny that computer has been spared. We haven't got your computer. It's what pupils try to say all the time. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Venting word is French, which is not in the dictionary is sacrilege. Oh no, gosh, no. In English, it's a free for all. I mean, that anti disestablishmentarianism, I, I, I invented that basically. Or not its components, they were there already, but no, anything goes in English, but it's got to kind of be in general currency for about five years, um, i.e. in one of these massive, massive corpora that lexicographers use to be able to be considered. I know so many disappear every year, so I had, so there are about six, seven thousand languages in the world. Again, what is a language? That's the subject of another talk. Um, there are thousands in the world, but speech, language use is dominated by about 200. Most of which are Europe, well, they're all European, essentially. Fewer than that, actually, a very small number. And some linguists say that, um, you know, eight, up to 80% of languages could have died off by the end of the century. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
do look on endangeredlanguages.com where you can find you can click on a, 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 stop, a spot on the map and you can find out what the language is and how many people speak it. No, we don't. Um, apart from dictionary authorities, that's kind of the closest we get really. Oxford English Dictionary is seen as like the standard for vocabulary, but grammar kind of language use generally not so much. No, no, not really. Free fall, as I say. Yes, precisely. We do laugh. That's absolutely true. Yeah. That's the danger of things like palinka, which are oral. They don't have a written tradition. And something that ethnolinguists do and anthropologists, they go around trying to record languages, trying to, so they can be learned. People can teach them in schools. And um, if I had time, I would tell you about a very interesting situation in Arizona. Uh, cut a very, very long story short, a language dying out, linguists went into the indigenous community to help, and it ended up in 1992 through a long, long process of snowball with the passing of the Native Languages Act in the United States. So it changed policy because some people on a reservation asked some linguists to come and help them make a book to help their children learn their native language. Um, Yes, it can be. No, but borrowing can happen in all sorts of directions. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I have a, P a former student who's now doing a PhD and he's in Toronto working on endangered languages. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of work going into it. I just want to see that this is not too. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I know they're being very proactive. That's great. Okay, we are going to have to finish, unfortunately, because it is one o'clock and I know that Jonathan needs this channel back. For another speaker but thank you so much for um for uh being so attentive and do get in touch if you want to ask me anything or you you think i can help you with anything <laughs> yes by all means if you send me your email address then i can send it to you okay <laughs> thank you shelly i remember you from last year shelly <laughs> yeah so I, I can put it in here it's ram1002 at um, at uk there we go Thank you, Magdalena. It's very kind. <laughs> Whoops, now I sent that to Jonathan. That's not very helpful. There we go. Thank you, Kurt. There's my email address, but it's on all the sides as well, okay? I've just posted it, Marek, so it's just above your comment. <laughs> Amazing, okay. Bye, see you next year, maybe. <laughs> Bon weekend, merci à vous. Merci. Bye, merci. <laughs>